Hello, and welcome to another edition of Legislative Update. My name is Tom Ayers, a senior staff writer for the Vermont Standard newspaper. And this is a collaboration between the Standard and Okemo Valley TV. Uh, I'd like to welcome once again um, our regular guest and my good friend, Representative Tesha Buss of uh, Woodstock and Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth, um, actually, correct? That's right. Um, in, in, terms of your, uh, in terms of your house um, district. And uh, it's great to see you again. It's been a couple of weeks since we've chatted. Yes, thank you so much for having me again, Tom. Absolutely, absolutely. We're going to focus today uh, as the legislative session um, winds down into its final few weeks. We're going to focus today on two topics that um, you've been um, pretty involved in at the State House in Montpelier, and that would be Act 250 reform and education funding, two real hot uh, hot button items on the les legislative agenda this session. Let's begin first with the Act 250 reform, and then we'll turn to the uh, funding questions. Um, I've been away for a couple of weeks, as as listeners may uh, may have recognized. Um, can you fill me in a little bit on what's gone on up to this point in terms of Act 250 reform at the legislature? Yes. Yeah, so there were three working groups this summer, and they were able to find consensus on many topics within Act 250 reform. And one of those main topics was to create a professionalized Natural Resources Board, because right now our nine commissions uh, work very, very independently, and they don't really have to answer to anyone above them in case there is a, a conflict with uh, how they see a permit moving forward. The way that they deal with that conflict is through the courts. And there's two different ways that uh, a project can go into the court system when you're going through the Act 250 process. One could be that um, there's just one specific permit. So Act 250 has uh, 10 criteria, but really there mm -hmm. are about 32 sub criteria. And that means that if you have an Act 250 permit, that means you could have, you know, uh, multiple smaller permits underneath it that deal with each of the criterion. Mm -hmm. So when one of those smaller permits is contested, that goes to court. What everyone's trying to do um, now with this professionalized board is that those small ones would still go to court, but your overall Act 250 permit would go in front of this natural resources board, um, which is also the same board that will be able to now manage these nine commissions and their district coordinators. So this summer, the consensus was never reached as to whether or not this professionalized board should handle appeals. Everyone agreed they should be professionalized and they should manage these commissions, but it was contentious whether or not they should do appeals. And it makes sense because um, on one side, they say it's more citizen friendly. You don't have to hire an attorney to, to have your Act 250 permit um, go in front of this particular um, commission. And yet you still would if individual pieces and parts go to the courts. The other challenge is that if your individual pieces and parts go to the courts and things are decided one way, and that is not in alignment with how the Natural Resources Professionalized Board will see your overall Act 250 permit, you could be stuck in a position as a, a business owner as to not knowing where to go and what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is extremely contentious. Um, I I spoke out strongly um, against having the appeals be done by the professionalized board because I don't believe that that is a very democratic process, meaning the same people who write the rules and exactly. govern would now be the law enforcement. So it'd be all three branches of government essentially under one board. And I feel like there needs to be some level of, of um, you know, when, when a court hears an opinion, it's an objective opinion. They don't have any skin in the game prior to mm -hmm. hearing a court case. And in this case, they would. Um, if the if the board um, 
is successful at hearing appeals. So right now, as it left the House, the board was still successful. The, they were, um, meaning the vote came down that the board would still hear appeals. Um, one thing that uh, the Rural Caucus was really active in this bill um, for a number of reasons. And the first of which is housing. Um, we wanted to make sure that the exemptions that were put forth last year would be able to stay in place until these new tiers get set up. So now they're going to be tiers of jurisdiction and exemption. So they kind of move in parallel. Um, they kind of want as much. Uh, so we want our critical natural resources of statewide significance. So we really want to think about um, wetlands and some of our uh, how we do river corridors and, um, you know, mm -hmm wildlife protections over here. And that will be, you know, immediately, even if you're a private landowner, if this is what you have on your property, you are going to have to go through the Act 250 process. Um, if you want to create a lot, that just means one lot. If, you, mm -hmm. if you've got 10 acres and you want to create two five acre lots, and that is existing in that area that you want to build in, you will be immediately triggered. Now, then conversely, if you are in downtown, if you're in Burlington and Manchester and some of our larger cities, you will also be then exempted. So mm -hmm. if you have a restaurant that you're creating in downtown Burlington, you'll have to get all of your building permits and such to do your um to to build, but you won't have to go through the Act 250 process because you probably shouldn't have to deal with wetlands in downtown Burlington or right. endangered right. species and 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 such, mm -hmm. so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Now that those two seem pretty cut and dried, they make sense. Um, what I fought for was for individual landowners and for our ski associations to be involved in the critical natural resources of state significance, because never before have private landowners had to worry about our individual parcel. Um, and splitting it up into two, having to go through the Act 250 process. Mm -hmm. um, so I really wanted there to be a robust public engagement included in that. Whether or not that stays in in the Senate, we'll see. But that I was successful in getting. We were also, as a rural caucus, um, able to get the housing exemptions through until we start hearing um, the applications for the tiers. It's not quite long enough, in my opinion, but it's better. So I'll take mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, the part where I'm most concerned about for rural Vermont is that we have these downtown village centers and Act 250 uh, may or may not have jurisdiction. It depends upon what that town is capable of putting through with bylaws um, to make sure that the town is thinking about if it's going to exempt a certain area from Act 250, then the Act 250 commissions, uh, you know, the folks um, really excited about what Act 250 does, wants to make sure that the town is capable of doing the majority of that work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in some towns, the majority of that work is, is no problem. They have staff and they have trained staff at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even a town like Woodstock really struggles to have the amount of staff to be able to complete those bylaws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and to expand the level of permitting that they may need to have in certain mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. The Stephen other Bauer and I have had this conversation, this very conversation. Stephen Bauer being the planning and zoning director in Woodstock, uh, yeah. who has a staff of two himself and one other person. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so you know, the real challenge too is that. So my main concern is that we are, um, while the regional planning commissions have a lot of this mapping work done, it'll it'll show us where the maps are um, that we'll look at, all right, here's definitely a 1A town like Burlington. Um, mm -hmm. Stock is, yeah, it's probably a 1B town. Um, and then so we we put these levels of exemption or jurisdiction in there. But until the maps are shown to the public, we don't actually know what we're voting on. And that's that's kind of my main issue here is that usually if you're not showing what you're going to exempt or take jurisdiction over in advance, 
um, that gives me great pause because mm -hmm. I, I appreciate transparent government and I don't feel like this is as transparent as I would like it to be. Mm -hmm. um, so we are going to have this, this jurisdiction. It looks like it will go through. Then we will have the maps out there. And from what we see in the maps of Woodstock, um, our exemption area won't even encompass the, the farmer's market. It won't encompass our junior high, high school. It won't encompass our affordable housing units. Um, so that is what I'm concerned about is that there's a, there's a real small circle that will be exempt. And I'm not for sure if that is particularly meaningful, if it doesn't encompass some of our largest employers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and and housing projects. So that that's a huge concern to me, and um, I don't know what it'll do, uh, frankly, to to Plymouth and Reading. We don't have water or wastewater, so we're certainly not going to be a, a tier one A or tier one B town. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ambiguity as to tier two, um, and so this process has been. Um, I think really what the overall goal should be, in my opinion, is that Act 250 should not be a process that is scary. It should be more citizen friendly. And there are lots of people that would argue that it, that is already the case today. And um, having gone through many, many permitting processes in my life and hiring um, attorneys and engineers to help through that process, I don't think that anything that costs the amount of money that Act 250 costs to actually just put through your application, mm -hmm. that to me is, I don't know what amount of money would be considered sort of citizen friendly, particularly if we are talking about, you know, subdividing our, our individual, um, you know, our, our homestead. Mm -hmm. um, so that, mm -hmm. That's a great question that I have is what is <laughs> the ultimate goal, even with the places that we've left under potential jurisdiction? Um, I'd like to make sure that everyone just has um, equal and equitable access. And that includes our towns. So what we didn't really receive that that bothers me still as well is that when the regional planning commissions have completed their mapping and we are supposed to then decide whether or not as a town, we're gonna to put through our application for a tier 1A or tier 1B status. There isn't a lot of robust public engagement. And that that has me concerned as well. I don't love top-down government. Um, it is easier sometimes. Some people would say it's more efficient sometimes, but um, I don't think it's as democratic as it should be, particularly mm -hmm. when we're talking about a change that is this large to to all of our towns. I've covered a fair amount of uh, Act 250 uh, permitting issues, as you know, for the yep. standard, um, whether it be Peacefield Farm in Woodstock, Sunnymead Farm uh, in Heartland, or uh, an effort to build a, a tiny house, tiny home tourist community in uh, in West Windsor. And three very different levels of projects in many respects. Uh, but the common denominator with each of those applicants has been uh, just relentless grousing about the bureauc bureaucracy and the legal costs that aspiring entrepreneurial developers um, are, are forced to absorb to get their projects off the ground, even something as small as the project in West Windsor, um, which was five tiny houses on two and a half acres of land right next to the post office. Uh, it took 19 months of legal wrangling to get that to final approval. Um, so I, I sympathize with the thrust of, of what this new iteration of Act 250 looks like in terms of supposedly streamlining, but I, um, I have to share your concern that um, it is not particularly democratic. You're basically setting the NRB up as judge, uh, jury, and executioner <laughs> in a sense. And um, um, uh, that concern was clearly expressed by you and by other legislators who uh, in the rural 
caucus who um, who are troubled by this. What's its fate likely to be in the Senate? Do you have a sense of how the Senate is likely to move on this? So the Senate is a peculiar body that I know very little about, but I will tell you that they have a, a housing bill, and then this is really a land use bill. What we voted on out of the House, the number is 687, and it's a land use bill. It really has nothing to do with housing. And, um, you know, definitely House members were certainly very concerned and frustrated by the fact that we we definitely stated that housing was our greatest priority, and we don't really feel that we've made momentous um, action towards mm -hmm. that. So what the Senate wanted to do was take the real true action-based housing bill and this land use bill and combine them. Mm -hmm. And boy, there are such they're very interesting and powerful personalities there that mm -hmm. I don't know how to um, to make out where it will go. But I can tell you that there are both sides of the of the argument over appeals in the Senate side. Um, mm -hmm. I know Senator Clarkson is very much in favor of the appeal staying with the courts and being able to just beef up the amount of judges that we have, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, and then I think the other side is like, well, we'll just beef up the NRB and then they get to hear these appeals and, um, and then we won't have to spend the money to do the judges and um, the amount that this Natural Resources Board is going to do on top of hearing appeals is extraordinary, and it is all brand new. Mm -hmm. And I know from personal experience how hard it is to set up a business. And, um, you know, we have one full-time person that we're uh, hiring for that, if that's what they choose, and four, four part-time people. And, you know, to write the entire rule book for how we're basically going to administer Act 250 in a new way in the entire state of Vermont, um, on top of handling appeals, on top of um, actually managing the district commissions and coordinators for the very first time, that's a that's to me a job in and of itself. Le leave the appeals away. And the, the other thing that has me concerned is that you know many people said we can come back to this. Like just let us come back to the appeals portion. Um, do do this really big amount of work, and then in two years decide whether or not you can handle it. And that there was real strong um, pushback against that, which also says to me, like, wow, OK. Um, yeah. it, my concern is that there's a lot of control and, yeah. uh, and it's all yeah. um, and I'm not for sure that it is. You know, there's also the Democratic represent. Um, OK, so everyone that's going to be on this new professionalized board, uh, while there are planners and there are land use folks, um, there's no one that represents the economic interests of the state. Some people would say that a that a town planner or a regional planner um, would be such a person, mm -hmm. and I'm not for sure that that is uh, to me that that uh, that is not the case. Um, from my opinion, they truly decide where business should be located, but not um, what towns need to economically uh, thrive mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. frequently. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's all about balance. That's really all I am looking for is um, is for a strong amount of balance mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that uh, everybody is really heard. Mm -hmm. uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, H687, um, the land use legislation that's coming out of the House. Um, is there anything in there that addresses, I know it's your major focus was housing, but is there anything in there that uh, addresses the intersection between Act 250 and Act 143, the on-farm business um, legislation that passed a couple of years ago? Because that's been the crux of the peace field debate, as you well know. And I just wonder if um, there's any effort to kind of get those things more in synergy with one another. Yes, there definitely was. There was some addressing of prime agricultural soils, and um, there were some levels of exemption for uh, on-farm business that would go that would be able to be exempted from Act Two Hundred and Fifty. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it's all, and who knows how that's going to play out in the Senate as well, because it definitely uh, boils down to figuring out how you measure whether or not it's truly a farm that has a business on it, rather mm -hmm. than the slippery slope of it being a business with a bit of farming activity. Mm -hmm. um, so the House had made its resolution and 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 pro provided some exemptions um, so that I don't have my finger on the pulse of where that, how that will go in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Let's turn to our other topic then for, for this morning, and that is uh, education funding, something that we've talked about quite a bit here um, on legislative update during this session. Where do things stand now in terms of education funding for the next year, but then the longer term picture as well? Yes. So House Education and House Ways and Means are both doing many things to try to help education moving forward. Mm -hmm. In House Education, we are creating a, a visioning working group. It is made up of the usual stakeholders, um, but we also put in there um, the Vermont Rural Education Collaborative and Census Space Funding Advisory Group. Um, so what we really want to do is study, it, there'll be meetings around the state, and we're going to look at the role of governance, you know, should the Agency of Education be one that just is a compliance organization and provides some tools or should they actually provide supports? Because right now they, they're not providing supports. Um, whether or not the State Board of Education should, uh, whether or not the, should we go back to being a department of education, which means that the secretary wouldn't be politically appointed and wouldn't change as our governors change, because we really need a consistent voice in education moving forward. Um, we also need to look at the the role of the state board, um, depending upon how it's going to stay. It's basically been doing rulemaking, but um, it frequently is in conflict with the agency of education. So do we need to have, and, and so it needs different legal staff. So um, those things will be decided. Mm -hmm. We need to look at career and technical education. We've got rural schools that that we can't staff because there's just not enough <clears throat> staff to staff them. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Act 46 did a lot of consolidation on the on the front of, you know, superintendents and, and sort of our, our higher level of education. But we definitely have some real small schools out there and it's really expensive. And consolidation is really hard. It's it's hard to talk about. So we really, really need to study it because the last thing that we want to do is do it and then not and then not show that there was any economic gain um, or perhaps most important education quality for our, for our kids. Mm -hmm. um, there are many kids out there that have um, expressed their opinions about lack of opportunity for them because their schools are so small. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are many amazing schools out there, but that don't even have uh advanced placement classes. And so what is the best way to deliver education in this extremely rural landscape that we are in for the majority of the state? And also the task, this working group will look at how um, our, where our private schools are located, um, not just mm -hmm. the four major academies, but plenty of other, of the, of the smaller schools, um, our auditor had put out that basically an extra million dollars per thousand children um, is what it costs for those academies and our private institutions. This group needs to study whether or not that's actually accurate. Mm -hmm. We also need to make sure that we have data. The Agency of Education has not provided the level of data that the House Education Committee has, has requested over the two years that I have been um, in office. And that's also really concerning. Some people will say, um, we've got 
some schools that are performing really beautifully. And uh, some people will say, oh, you know, our private schools are far surpassing our public schools. But I don't actually see data that shows that because they mm -hmm. they don't have to provide that data. Or if they do have to provide some parts of that data, it's not being shared. So what we really need to do, and I'll say, I said it with Act 250, I'm going to say it here. I really appreciate transparent government. Um, and that's what I'm not seeing enough of. And it's very frustrating. So hopefully... Mm -hmm this working group will get to some of that. And mm -hmm. they'll provide some actionable levels next legislative session. Um, and then in, um, so in January of 2025, we'll be able to make some choices. And then mm -hmm. in January of 2026 is that's when we'll have the final report and, and the House Education Committee will be able to dive in and, and see what they have to say. Then Ways and Means, um, which is who determines the funding part of it, um, not the education part, but the funding part. Mm -hmm. So right now um, they are going to make some short-term measures. They're going to repeal the tax exemption on cloud-based software, and this will offset universal school meals. Then mm -hmm. um, they will ensure that uh, they're, because of the strange way that our funding played out this year, they are concerned that there are some income sensitive taxpayers that may actually pay um, higher than their level of income for their property than folks that are not income sensitive taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So in order to ensure that, uh, that that does not happen, they had to raise some revenue and what is on the table um, to be voted on this week is a 1.5% increase to the meals and rooms tax, but it is only for short-term rentals. Um, and I'm not for sure uh, mm. how they will absolutely make that determination. Um, I mean, obviously, if you use Airbnb and VRBO and Vacasa that remit taxes on behalf of their subscribers or members, mm -hmm. uh, that will be easy. But there definitely are other short-term rentals that just have a meals and rooms tax number and submit it that way. So it'll be interesting to see if that passes. Um, I definitely understand the way to raise that, 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 that we need to have um, a way to raise revenue. Um, but it also seems interesting that it's just one category. Um, mm -hmm. And um, moving forward, they want to look at some allowable growth rates and set excess th spending thresholds. What they're kind of looking at is, well, maybe what we do is send everybody just a big chunk of money. Everybody gets a chunk of money for their pupils. And that might be the average daily membership or the long-term weighted average daily membership, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, because rural like Woodstock is a rural school district, it actually benefits from those weights. Um, and so it, then it, it, that increases the membership, um, mm -hmm. not by actual mm -hmm. heads, but by the amount of funding that you can receive. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think, you know, supposedly this will go through not until 2026. Who knows how much will actually be able to be worked out. Um, there's an advisory group also being set up in the yield bill um, to do these kinds of off-season continuous studies and robust engagement. I mean, we've studied education finance every way to Sunday. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, a, a part of it is just, you know, opening up the same can of worms we've always had. Yet, education and what our children need is vastly different than it's ever been before from the mental mm -hmm. health perspective. And we're looking at why our educational outcomes aren't meeting our level of investment. And, you know, a large part of that may be mental health. Because if you are not in a place to learn, um, you're not going to learn. You can have the best teacher in the world right in front of you. You can have all the surroundings that would say success, success, success. But if your brain and your body is not set and ready to receive, you're mm -hmm. not. You're not emotionally and mentally equipped to, to absorb it. Um, all the all the fine teaching in the world isn't going to 
isn't going to sink in. So, right. Uh, well, um, an incredibly complex subject uh, that we'll continue to drill into as as things go on um, toward the end of this legislative session and into the, the next biennium as well. Um, thanks again, Tasha. We'll see you next week for another edition of Legislative Update. Uh, this is Tom Ayers of the Vermont Standard uh, in partnership with uh, Okemo Valley TV. Signing off. Till next week. Take care, Tasha. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.